Welcome back, guys. So earlier this week, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets released their report on stablecoins. This report gives us the official position of all the US financial regulators on how they feel stablecoins, and thus cryptocurrencies in general, should be regulated. And to cut to the chase, the regulators are saying that stable coins should be regulated like bank deposits. Now, this is a very high standard of regulation. In truth, it's a much higher level of regulation than I expected. There's approximately $130 billion in stable coins right now, and none of it even comes close to meeting the standards required of a bank. Now, should Congress pass a law bringing this type of regulation into effect, it would have massive repercussions on the crypto space. And so that's what we'll talk about in today's video. OK, so first up, what are stablecoins? Well, they're a type of cryptocurrency, but they're quite different to the speculative coins that you hear a lot about, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. A stablecoin is a cryptocurrency that's supposed to always be worth a dollar. There's a number of ways that these things can be structured, but the simplest kind is what's known as a backed stable coin, where you sell coins for one dollar, take that dollar, put it in a bank or some sort of safe interest bearing security, and then stand ready to buy back the stable coin with that dollar upon request. So why do these things exist? They might at first sound entirely unnecessary, but they exist because the banking system is heavily regulated. There are capital requirements requiring banks to have more assets than deposits. There are KYC and anti-money laundering requirements. And when people want to do banking-like activities in crypto without being subject to that regulation, they can use these coins. Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, has compared stable coins to casino chips. They're a way of storing money for use in crypto. Now, to a certain extent, these are like the on and off ramps to crypto trading and investing. Once you put your money in a stable coin, you can then use it to buy and sell other cryptos without having to interact with the traditional banking system for each transaction. Compared with things like wire transfers of dollars, stablecoins can settle deals far more quickly. The speed of settlement has very little to do with advanced blockchain technology, though. It relates much more to avoiding the red tape of the banking industry. Stablecoins are also used in decentralized finance, where they can earn income for investors in a variety of ways, including being lent out to other users or being used to provide liquidity for trading. Due to the current lack of regulation in the crypto space, stablecoins can be likened to numbered bank accounts, meaning that you can have tens of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in an account with no known owner. If you have the keys to that account, it's yours. Regulators and tax authorities right now don't really know who owns that money or necessarily where it came from. Now, stablecoins have been around since around 2014, but their use exploded this year in 2021. In January, there were around $30 billion worth of stablecoins in circulation, and by October, there were $130 billion in existence. The market leader is Tether, which makes up more than half of the stablecoins in existence. Tether has been in regulator sites for quite a while. A Zeke foe from Bloomberg describes Tether as a company that seems to be practically quilted out of red flags. In February, they paid $18.5 million to settle with the New York Attorney General, who accused Tether and its sister exchange Bitfinex of covering up massive losses. The investigation said that for periods of time, the company had no access to bank accounts anywhere in the world, despite its claims that it held one dollar for every tether. OK, so let's get to the report. The President's Working Group on Financial Markets is made up of the Secretary of the Treasury and the heads of all the key US financial regulators. The report, which I've linked to in the description, says that stablecoin issuers should become insured depository institutions on a par with banks that offer savings accounts to customers. 
An argument can be made that these things could be regulated more like money market mutual funds, which face far less regulation than banks, but it would appear that the regulators are pushing for quite a high level of regulation. Now, this proposal mirrors the Stable Act, which was presented to Congress just under a year ago, and it would require stablecoin operators to obtain full banking licenses. Now, if you've been following any of the news on crypto regulation, you probably saw the story back in September where Coinbase was warned by the SEC against launching a product that would allow consumers to earn interest on their crypto holdings. They were told that this would be considered a security and subject to disclosure and registration requirements under the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Coinbase decided not to launch the product rather than comply with these regulations. Now, a bank account is not considered a security because securities laws exempt bank accounts. The reason that they're exempted, though, is that they are subject to banking regulation, which is generally much stricter. You don't have to file a prospectus, but you do have to meet bank capital requirements, deal with bank examiners and all the rest. So if Coinbase backed away at the idea of securities regulation, they'll absolutely hate the idea of certain tokens being regulated as banking products. Requiring stablecoin operators to obtain banking licenses would bring a massive increase in supervision for stablecoin issuers, who have up until now avoided any real regulation at all. Being regulated like a bank would not just subject them to all sorts of government oversight, but it would also give them access to emergency liquidity from regulators in times of stress, and customer deposits would fall under FDIC insurance up to a certain dollar amount. One question that we need to ask, though, is whether the people currently running this $130 billion industry would meet the standards required by banking regulators. Ownership of significant holdings of bank stock requires approval of federal and sometimes state regulators in the United States. If you want to own more than 10% of a bank, US regulators need to run a background check to assess your character. A felony conviction would disqualify an individual from owning over the 10% mark. Other factors that raise concerns with respect to the purchaser's competence or integrity would also disqualify them. Now, when Tether settled with the New York Attorney General in February, she said in a statement that Tether Holdings had been operated by unlicensed and unregulated individuals and entities dealing in the darkest corners of the financial system. So that might give you a bit of a feeling as to how uh, you know their CVs might look to a banking regulator. Now, if we look at the backgrounds of really any of the people involved, it strikes me as unlikely that they would be eligible to own significant shares in, not to mention run a US licensed bank. So in the event of this regulation coming into place, there would be a lot of change in the industry. Reading the report, you can see that the regulators are concerned about the rapid growth of the industry. The rapid growth of stablecoins increases the urgency of this work, according to the report. It would appear to me that right now the traditional financial system is reasonably insulated from the crypto economy. The biggest link between the two is that stablecoins claim to be keeping their reserves in commercial paper and other money market instruments. This claim is disputed by many people in that space. Last month, Zeke Foe at Bloomberg tried to fact check Tether's claim that they have about $30 billion invested in commercial paper. He canvassed Wall Street traders to see if any had seen Tether buying anything and no one had. Right now, a big blow up in the crypto space would likely not reach out into the broader economy. But regulators do see this massive growth and most likely want to get involved to protect middle class Americans from 
possible fraudulent actors in the space as crypto investing becomes more mainstream. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that the space is fraudulent. I'm saying that within the space, there are certain fraudulent actors. And obviously, securities regulators are just general financial regulators don't want to see people putting their savings into things that turn out to be frauds. Other proposals in the report include increasing federal oversight of wallet providers. Wallet providers are groups that offer products that allow users to hold their crypto tokens. And the report also recommends requiring stablecoin issuers to limit their affiliation with commercial entities. According to the FT, a senior administration official said that the president's working group was prepared to take direct action if Congress did not act urgently on these recommendations. This could include seeking a Financial Stability Oversight Council designation of certain stablecoin activities, which would allow the appropriate agency to establish risk management standards related to them. So a question I'm left with is whether stablecoins would exist at all should this type of regulation be passed. It seems unlikely to me that the current stablecoin providers could transition into being banks. As I mentioned earlier, these products are a lot like numbered bank accounts with no name on them. They can move money quickly by sidestepping financial regulations. Should they become subject to banking regulation, it's not obvious to me what value they would add in the marketplace. Banks are a thing that already exist. If you enjoyed this video, you should check this one out next. Have a great day and see you again soon. Bye.